Hey guys, this is John, and I'm playing multicast in the one minute pool on ICC. Just kidding, I'm not doing that at all today. <laughs> uh, I'm actually doing a book review. This is the first book review that I've posted on my channel, and also probably the first time many of you have seen me in person. So uh, I can confirm that I do actually exist beyond that voice you hear talking over the ICC or chess.com board. Uh, but I'm really excited today because I'm going to be reviewing a book that a friend of mine wrote, uh, Mr. Tony Rotella. This is his name right here, and this is the book he wrote called The Killer Sicilian. And this is a book on the Kalashnikov variation of the Sicilian, which if you don't know what that is, that's completely fine because I'm going to try to give you a good overview. And Tony just finished that at the end of 2014, so end of this past year, and it's just now making its way into the chess marketplace, uh, published by Everyman Chess, and it clocks in at, I believe, 464 pages. And aside from Tony being my friend, um, I know him to be a very thorough and extremely, um, I would say, studious individual when it comes to his chess writing, as evidenced by the fact that it took him four years to write this book. <laughs> and uh, Tony has been a longtime subscriber to my channel, so I know he'll be in the comments uh, probably talking about that process and also answering any questions that you guys might have. But uh, overall, I just really enjoyed this book, and I hope to kind of share my findings with you guys and uh, also give Tony a little bit of press because uh, he deserves it. So I hope to make this also a, um, a feature of my channel. I have another book review in the pipeline, so keep a heads up for that in the coming weeks. All right, hope you guys enjoyed the review. Talk to you later. All right, so I thought I'd start off just by showing uh, The Killer Sicilian on Amazon. It's a current Amazon page where you can go and take a preview of it. Uh, so this is the cover. Very nice looking cover, if you ask me. Uh, every man seems to follow this style of covers, their opening books. Um, look alike in this capacity, kind of like the glossy pieces and the critical position. So you can already tell that the Kalashnikov has something to do with an early pawn thrust in the center, attacking this knight that is on d4, and we have this tension between the black knight on c6 and the white knight on d4. Um, so there's Tony, and the foreword was, was written by Alexander Shabalov, who is um, an American grandmaster by way of uh, Latvia, and he's known as a really exciting player. No wonder that Tony um, got him to write the forward. It was a good move, I think, because Shabalov has been known to play this line. And in fact, I've played Shabalov in this line, which uh, I'll talk about a little bit later. So that's the cover. And just scrolling down a little bit, um, there's a nice table of contents. And what I like about this book and what I've kind of decided that I like about uh, certain opening books in general is that it starts with the most critical lines and then it works backwards. So Tony just dives right into what he thinks is one of the most important lines for the assessment of the entire Kalashnikov, which uh, this might be a little bit small, but the critical eight knight c4, which I'm going to show you guys soon. And he works back to lesser tries. And you can see the book ends, um, this is the chapter number, but the book ends with anti-Sicilians. So the first eight chapters just have to do exclusively with the Kalashnikov, which is, um, you know, what the book, I guess it's not titled the Kalashnikov or anything, but it, this Kalashnikov is the selling point of this book. But I think a really nice aspect of Tony's work is that he includes these six other chapters on anti-Sicilians. And it's a pretty comprehensive list, too, of anti-Sicilians. So including some stuff that, honestly, he probably could have just easily kept out if he wanted. Uh, for instance, like White's odd second moves, you know, <laughs> that doesn't have anything to do with the Kalashnikov necessarily, but it's nice that he included all of these options. So this is a real comprehensive book, which is what stood out to me, first of all, and uh, it, it's pretty clear that the author went the extra mile in writing this. Um, anytime you have a book that's basically like a, a one-stop job to learn an entire opening, I think that's a, a huge advantage. So... Table of contents there. Um, the forward, one thing I learned in the forward, written by Alex Shabalov, is uh, that this line used to be known as the Accelerated Sveshnikov, named after Evgeny Sveshnikov, a Russian grandmaster who pioneered a very similar system, the Sveshnikov variation. But I had no idea that the Kalashnikov was actually known as the Accelerated Sveshnikov. So I thought that was interesting. Um, in the introduction, uh, the first known... Um, instance of this defense was apparently in this game McDonald versus Labordene from 1834. And 
This culminated in a very nice diagram, which many of you guys will recognize probably, where black has pawns on d2, e2, and f2. And despite having only a rook and bishop against white's queen and rook, black is completely winning here because those pawns are just promoting um, inexorably and there's nothing white can do about it. And Tony goes on to say how it was kind of a shame that this game didn't ignite more of an interest in the Kalashnikov variation uh, because it really wasn't until the 1980s, he says, that people started taking a, a notice in this of this opening. So he has a very nice introduction. Um, I don't think this preview on Amazon shows all of it, but yeah, he talks about typical pawn structures and strategic ideas. I love this. Uh, and I'm going to show you guys a couple examples that he gives, but I, I love when opening books do this. They don't just dive immediately into uh, the meat and potatoes of the theory. He takes time to explain, you know, like here are the type of pawn structures you're working with. Here are some common themes you might want to uh, pay attention to. Like here you have a skeleton structure, so you know what you're operating with. He talks about the pluses and minuses for uh, both sides. So that's a real nice aspect of, of an opening book. Like anytime it goes above and beyond simply making recommendations and it actually tells you like how to use the opening itself and like what you can expect, I like that. And Tony himself has played this opening for many years. Um, I believe mainly online and in correspondence play. And uh, he... He has amassed like a wealth of, of personal knowledge about the opening too. So I really like that introduction. And this follows the uh, move tree format. So if I can get down into, once I get past the introduction here, uh, it follows the move tree format. So here's chapter one, uh, the critical knight c4. So where it doesn't follow games necessarily, he just proceeds down the line and gives the line as how he sees fit and often games that he's citing are in the notes or whatnot. Um, so there's pluses and minuses to that approach. I think for a book like this, that makes sense following a move tree format. Um, a lot of people like opening books that give um, the most important games in whatever line they're studying and like try to extrapolate the theory based on those games. But I think if for a book like this, that's fairly comprehensive, I mean, totally comprehensive, honestly, uh, this was a good approach because really there's, no way you could get to everything you want to cover without doing the move tree format. So that's that's the way the book was written. Um, yeah, and, and like I said, 120 pages, I'm just going to go down to the, the end, but 120 pages of this 464-page book are devoted to these, um, this is the, the very index, the back of the book, they're devoted to lines other than the Kalashnikov. So here you have the anti-Kalashnikov, uh, which is white playing knight c3 on move 3. So basically anything other than white playing d4 on move 3. Tony spends 120 pages covering all those lines. The Ross Limo Sicilian, uh, bishop b5, very popular line. The Alapin, or the c3 Sicilian, he gives you a line against that. Uh, the closed Sicilian, Grand Prix, uh, and even just a host of other just offbeat tries on move 2, including random stuff like you know the wing gambit b4. So I just love to see that, like authors going like above and beyond, like this is really his baby, this book, you can tell because um, he's pretty much poured his heart and soul into it. So that's just a quick overview of it. Uh, now we will get into actually discussing um, some lines in this opening. So let me switch to my chess.com board and I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm just going to select a different region. So. I prepared uh, a few different files just to kind of illustrate um, what I think Tony would like potential readers to know about the Kalashnikov and what I picked up from this book too, because I've never played this opening from the black side. I have played it from the white side, but um, my knowledge was very limited about this whole opening until I picked up this book. So I'm going to flip it around and look at it from black's point of view. So the Kalashnikov variation is characterized by knight c6 on move two in the Sicilian. And then after d4, which most people will tell you, Sicilian players is both white and black, d4 is the main try for an advantage, the open Sicilian. So it's characterized by, after c takes d4, knight takes d4, this move e5, okay, e5, immediately challenging the knight on d4. This is a provocative move. Um, there's some clear advantages and some pretty clear disadvantages about this move too. Um, to understand the Kalashnikov, you have to understand like its origins. Um, so this guy, Yevgeny Sveshnikov, this very opinionated grandmaster, 
For a very long time, he claimed that knight f6, knight c3, and only then e5 was basically the best way of combating e4. <laughs> he was one of um, the only grandmasters who I think shared this opinion, maybe one of the only players in the world, who really believed in this defense for black. And that's how it, it came to bear his name, the Sveshnikov defense, and rightly so. Um, so that's with the inclusion of knight f6 and knight c3, and only then e5. And the comparison between these lines is obvious. Like they, they lead to similar structures, but the Kalashnikov, in my mind, is just a, a more flexible way of playing this position. And Tony makes the point that the Kalashnikov is actually can be more positional than the Sveshnikov. The Sveshnikov has some very, very sharp lines. The Kalashnikov does too, but uh, you can play the Kalashnikov in a more positional way because you haven't committed this knight. So after e5, one thing that is important to note right off the bat, which Tony talks about, is if white doesn't play knight b5 here, then black will at least equalize. That I already knew, but it was nice to like see his reasoning and his justification for why that is. But basically, if white plays anything other than knight b5 here, black has no trouble whatsoever. So, for instance, knight takes c6, which is the move that was played in that McDonald versus Labardene game, is well met by b takes c6. And then after bishop c4, knight f6, knight c3, black has several ways to play here. But suffice it to say, with black having two center pawns compared to white's one, and with the assistance of the c6 pawn, giving him a lot of central influence and covering the d5 square, which in the Kalashnikov is a traditionally weak square, this position is no problem. And uh, those of you who will read the book will see that Tony actually recommends bishop c5 here, which is an interesting move. Um, I think bishop b4 would be most people's choice, but bishop c5, he makes a strong case for this move too. That's chapter 8 in the book. So other moves in this position, like you know your, your bland knight f3, or especially knight b3. I know from um, seeing lots of students' games in this line, like knight b3 is a popular way of playing this position. But after knight f6, knight c3, bishop b4, again, black has no trouble at all because you're threatening to win a pawn, the e4 pawn, and you can often get a quick d5 in too to get rid of this backward pawn. So if white does anything other than knight b5, there's no trouble at all. So uh, those alternatives appear a little bit later in the book, alternatives to knight b5. But um, after knight b5, let's talk about this position a little bit because this kind of makes up the Kalashnikov. And if you're thinking about playing this opening, there's a couple things you have to be comfortable with. Uh, one is just the strategic defects that you've taken on in the center, especially that d5 square. So when you're pushing e5 as black, you no longer have a pawn that can control this square. Your c pawn is gone and your e6 pawn flew the coop. It's already on e5. <laughs> okay, so the d5 square, like often um, the assessment of the position will revolve around whether the d5 square is a strength or a weakness. For the respective sides. Okay. Um, in return, you gain a lot of activity. I mean, you've already forced White's Knight to move multiple times. And often it seems to me like Black is the one kind of dictating matters early on in this. I think that's a real big appeal of this opening. Uh, so after Knight b5, Black will play d6. This is played to just cover the d6 square because if White gets a chance, Knight d6 would be an appealing move, which would all but force Black to part with the dark square bishop and I'll allow white's queen to come in. So that's not at all a part of the Kalashnikov. So d6. And here, here's where we get to um, some of the early chapters. White can play several different moves. Um, knight c3, knight 1 to c3 that is, and c4 are the most common moves. But there are some offbeat alternatives as well that Tony gives plenty of coverage to in the middle of the book. Um, the only time that I've had this position over the board from the white side, I've played knight c3, um, just because I was a little bit more comfortable with that position. And in my experience, more people play this move, knight c3, probably because they're secretly hoping for a transposition into the Sveshnikov, which could be reached after a6, knight a3, knight f6. Now we're back in that Sveshnikov variation that I cited earlier. So I think that explains at least in part, the popularity of, of knight 1 to c3 over c4. But Tony gives these moves like equal coverage. Um, I don't think he says exactly like which one is better. He, I think he actually says that knight 1 c3 
has potential to be better than c4. c4 looks to really clamp d5. But if white plays c4, that has a drawback too. It's that uh, this d4 square becomes weak. Right? So like now white has no pawn that can guard that d4 square. So it's kind of like you know, tit for tat, basically. Like, black is giving up control of d5, white has an absolute clamp on that square, but in return, they're gaining control over d4. So, uh, knight 1, c3, we'll just go with this line for now, just as by way of introduction. Then, you kick out this knight, a6, and this is nice for black, that white's knight is forced back to a very passive square, knight a3. Um, now, in this position, Tony's recommendation at this juncture was something that already made me take notice of this book. Um, so in games that I've had previously from this position from the white side, I think I've only seen b5. b5 is a, a good way to grab space on the queen side and threaten b4, forking the two knights. And I, the game I had against Alexander Shabalov uh, went b5. He played this move. But Tony's recommendation is bishop e7 for black, which, having looked at the material, I think is a much craftier move. So bishop e7. Idea of this move is you stay flexible. Um, there's several systems that he analyzes where black might play f5 and then stick the knight on f6 only after the pawn is on f5. Kind of like in the queen's gambit when white puts the pawn on, on c4 and only then brings the knight in behind it to c3. So similar idea. Um, also, by playing bishop e7 before committing the knight to f6, you maintain the option of bishop g5 which is a key motif, and Tony says you're going to get sick of seeing that motif <laughs> once you read the book, because trading these dark square bishops is a, is a good way to get rid of black's bad bishop, basically. This bishop is stuck behind the pawn chain. Uh, moving it from e7 does have potential to weaken the d6 square, but you'll see this idea crop up many, many times throughout the book, bishop g5. So I thought this was an interesting recommendation, and uh, I liked it a lot. Um, here, Knight c4 is the critical move, and that makes up uh, the first chapter. White has some alternatives to, like, knight d5, for instance, and some other moves. But knight c4, and then after b5, knight e3, white is focusing all their attention on this d5 square. And then after knight f6, we get to the position that makes up uh, the bulk of chapter 1, basically. So th that was just a very rough overview of the Kalashnikov. Um, I could imagine one of the difficulties in writing this book is that this is an opening that is tricky to handle because it is so strategically like tenuous for black. I mean, by playing e5 and making um, that big of a concession in the center in regards to that d5 square in particular, black has to be very precise and there's some very nuanced ways of handling the resulting position. So I actually think like the reason why... Um, like a comprehensive Kalashnikov book hasn't appeared before this work is because it's such a tough opening to write about. Um, it requires a lot of experience and on the plus side, someone who's really willing to go into um, the work of studying this opening, I think it could pay off brilliantly for Black. Like I'm even thinking about trying it myself, uh, probably in some Blitz games, not OTB anytime soon, but um, I know that uh, like Kristoff, for instance, Chess Explained, Christoph Selecki, he has been trying this for black, and I think he even tried it in uh, one of his recent tournament games after looking at Tony's work. So for you club players out there, though, I think this is a great opening just for the fact that it gives you great chances to at least equalize almost by force in the opening if white really, really, really doesn't know what to do. Um, in fact, there's a comment that Tony makes that uh, we'll get to in a little bit where he says, if you're a club player, pay attention to this particular chapter because this is what will happen all the time in your games. So, yep, little rundown of Klashnikov, that's it. And, um, you know, these are the variations that make up the first chapters involving either knight 1 to c3 or c4 in this position and the complications surrounding those. Uh, next, I wanted to show you just a couple examples of positions that he discusses, and I want to see if you guys can spot the motif. Okay, so this is in the introduction. He talks about strategic ideas that are pertinent to the Kalashnikov. So let's take a look at this position. And if you want to pause your recording after I explain this, you can do that. Uh, so this is black to move. This is given as a typical Kalashnikov position. 
So black to play here, what do you think black should do? Okay, so in the game, this is a game Sitnikov versus uh, Tommy Nieback. So in the game, black played b5 in that position. Interesting way of striking at the c4 pawn, which in turn is defending the d5 square. So black is using a flank pawn to try to destabilize white's control of the center. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, isn't that b5 square guarded three times by white? And you would be right, yes it is. <laughs> it's only defended once by the a6 pawn. But after c takes b5, black has this nice move knight a7, opening up an attack on the c3 knight. And this gives black great counterplay. Um, if this knight moves, as it did in the game, knight d5, black can take here. And black had no trouble in the resulting position. Knight takes f6, bishop takes f6. This knight was already ready to pop itself into c3. So white took on b5, parted with that. And black got a good position. They had the two bishops, and it managed to open the position up. So the b5 thrust is a move that uh, comes up quite frequently in the book. And I think just in general for the Sicilian, this would be a thematic idea to know um, for you players who play the Meroxi bind or the hedgehog from the black side, you know that b5 is a standard uh, thrust in these type of positions. So, oh, and after c takes d5, c takes b5, knight a7, if white were to defend the knight, let's say something like, I don't know, bishop b2, I think black can calmly take on b5 once again. So let's say knight takes. Because if white goes after that pawn, then the e4 pawn would be left without a defender. So, like, knight takes e4. There may be something better in that sequence, but... Yeah, so b5, good move for black here. Let's take a look at another position that is given by Tony. Okay, this one, I'm including this next one. This wasn't uh, part of the introduction necessarily. I believe this was from chapter one, no, chapter two, I think. But I'm giving this just to show you like the level of depth and the type of writing style that Tony has. So this is a position from, uh, I believe it was one of his own games that he got. And he talks about this in real great detail. And I think I'm just going to uh, read to you guys what he says about this. Because when I read this passage, I, it really convinced me that you know he had, he had done his homework on this opening. So it's black to move. Uh, or sorry, black had just played the move uh, queen a7 in this position. So he says, Houdini thinks play is approximately equal. And he says, I'm honestly still skeptical. And a bunch of engine versus engine games and a Monte Carlo simulation agree. It took me a long time to figure out this position strategically, but I think I have the hang of it now. There are a few key details to this position for black. The first is that white will have no acceptable way to dislodge the very strong steed on d4, so referencing the knight coming into d4, without giving up material. Uh, we have the option of setting up bishop b7 takes d5 thereafter. And he says, the, the second thing to note is that if one or both pairs of rooks come off the board, the position is really present, pleasant for black, not only because that's white's main advantage right now, but also because we're well on our way to enforcing a knight versus bishop endgame with bishop takes d5. So white will usually look to play on the king side with f4, f5, and g4, g5. And we're going to try and set up a rook trade, and bishop takes d5. In a lot of cases, black will start with a5 and bishop a6, putting some pressure on the c-pawn while clearing the back rank a bit. And then he goes on to list like another paragraph full of lines that he thinks are plausible from this position. So this is, um, I think it's move number 24, is what move number it was when this position was reached. And to me, that just showed tremendous like dedication to explaining um, the plans in the middle game. Like That's something that anyone whether you're a 1200 or a grandmaster, would love to hear about this position. You wouldn't want to just hear like, oh, black has good play. Like he's actually telling you like how he thinks the game will go and what the resulting play in the middle game will look like. Uh, granted, it's from uh, a black perspective, but <laughs> presumably that's why you're buying this book because you're interested in playing the Kalashnikov. So I thought that was a real 
uh, nice way of explaining the position. And stuff like that is, is peppered throughout the book. So lots of text explanations, not just contenting himself with giving like a computer evaluation of the resulting position. So, um, oh, one other thing. This is the chapter he was referring to about club player advice. So he was talking, this is in, which chapter is this? I'll just check my notes here, having to refer to the book sometimes. This is chapter two still. Um, so he talks about, get this line up, the line after e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, e5, knight b5, the critical move, d6, knight c3, a6, knight a3, and now this bishop e7. Uh, so this move, knight d5. So I'm going to quote Tony now on page 85. He says, if you're a club player with a limited amount of time to dedicate to this book, uh, and then in parentheses he says, I'll concede it grew larger than I had originally planned. <laughs> he says, I implore you, emphasis on implore, I implore you to study this variation thoroughly. You will see this line a disproportionate number of times in your games compared to knight c4, which he thinks is the more critical move. Um, you'll see this line a disproportionate number of times in your games compared to knight c4. And because white players generally see black's seventh and realize that they know nothing about it and decide to play it exactly like Sveshnikov by tossing the knight out to d5. However, here black gains since bishop e7 is far more useful than b5 and less weakening to boot. So again, good practical advice. Um, that's something that, you know, if I were to play this opening, regardless of my rating, I would want to know just from his experience, like why, why knight d5 might be preferred over a more theoretically challenging move like knight c4, let's say. So I thought that was nice to see too. Um, finally, I wanted to show you a game he gives, which I think is really cool. This is a game that is <laughs> probably one of the more exciting games in the book. Uh, John Nunn versus Alexander Natoff from France, 1999. I haven't analyzed this game in detail because uh, the details are in the book, <laughs> but I think this is representative of the type of swashbuckling Kalashnikov game that uh, an aspiring player of this opening might want to see. So here we have a case where white plays c4, trying for that clamp on the d5 square. Black plays bishop e7, staying flexible. Knight 1, c3, a6. Uh, I don't know exactly, I'd have to check whether Tony prefers a6 immediately or bishop e7. Um, I'm going to say bishop e7 since a6 immediately might even allow white to play knight back to c3 using this knight. So black plays bishop e7, waits for this knight to come out to c3, and now flicks in the move a6. So this knight is forced back to the pretty undesirable a3 square. So here's where this, the flexibility of the Kalashnikov is revealed, because Natov plays this move f5, which, as I explained earlier, is one of the key points of delaying the development of this knight. So f5. None responds with bishop d3, and now f4. This kind of reminds me of like a uh, king's Indian defense. Black's pawn structure pointed right at the king side, right at the side of the board where white would normally be castling. So establishing a very aggressive chain. G3 was played, trying to undermine that pawn. Uh, knight F6. I believe in this position, Tony gives two moves. Knight F6 and also Knight H6, which is pretty interesting, keeping the, H, the F file open. So Knight F6, G takes F4, E takes F4, Bishop takes F4. So black is sacrificing a pawn now. But after castles, it will be a risky proposition for white to castle, since if they did, black would get in like bishop h3 right away, amongst other things. So the non natov game continues bishop g3. And now here, Natov plays a move that Tony says is dubious. Um, Tony recommends bishop h3 in this position, and he goes on to analyze that move. But he gives this game as like an illustrative game in the line. So Natov played knight g4. And here on page 132, Tony says that f4, is the best move for white in response to this. 
But instead, Nun plays a rather provocative move, bishop e2, after which Nataf, who is a, a very strong tactical player, by the way, plays knight takes f2, looking to destroy white's king, basically. <laughs> and here, white responded with queen d5 check, trying to inconvenience black's king before taking this knight. So bishop takes f2, and now knight b4. And again, I'm not going to go through every single line, but um, bishop takes f2 is also possible here. But I assume it would be similar to the game. Black would be sacrificing on f2 and then playing bishop h4 check is kind of the point. So like take, rook takes, king takes, bishop h4 check, and white's king is going to be on the run. It's nice that the king can't retreat here, so it's going to be caught on the g and the f files. So the game proceeded. Queen d5 check, king h8. Bishop takes f2, knight b4, queen h5, and here Nataf, as uh, you saw in the last variation, adds more fuel to the fire by playing rook takes f2. King takes f2, bishop h4 check. So now black is down a full rook, but white's king safety has been compromised to an extreme. Uh, after g6, the white queen was forced back to f3. Queen g5 check, and black's pieces just filter into the game so fast now. King f1, and now a nice tactical stroke, bishop h3 check. Preparing an avenue for the rook to get over to f8 very quickly. Queen takes h3, rook f8 check, bishop f3, queen e3, attacking the, the bishop here. So now if we count the material, white's up a boatload. <laughs> They're up, what, a rook and a minor piece? but they're completely lost because of the pressure on the bishop on f3. Note that king g2, trying to guard f3, would just run into queen f2 mate. So none settled for queen takes h4. And now <laughs> you'd think that Nataf would take on f3 with the rooker with the queen. Nope, just brings another attacker into the game, knight d3. <laughs> Probably knew that this bishop was a goner anyways, and he wants to threaten mates on f2 in the future. Uh, this, this queen is the only thing standing in the way, but very powerful move and characteristic of a strong attacking player who would value including another um, attacker versus simply trying to gain material back by taking on f3. None plays knight d5, queen takes f3 check, king g1, and now knight f2. Unusual move, but threatens queen takes h1, and also threatens knight h3. The queen takes h1 threat is basically unstoppable. So king f1 was played, queen takes, king e2, and that was such a bloodbath that black takes back, and now black is actually up material because of that transaction that just occurred, and none decided to resign here. With his king flailing in the wind, and you know his position utterly destroyed. So this is just a cool Kalashnikov game that uh, Tony includes in the book, and you know, he presents it, but he also includes ways that uh, both sides can improve. For instance, like this critical position, where Natov ventured this knight g4 move. Um, under analysis, this doesn't quite hold up, according to Tony, because of f4, but he gives an alternative way that black can still have fun in this line where they sacrifice a pawn and still expect like a good position. So that's bishop h3. So this was, uh, once again, going back, one of the lines with c4, and then black playing for this ambitious f5 move, which, by the way, at various points, Tony says, you know, you can play f5, or if you're not comfortable pushing ref pawn up the board, you can also uh, play a little more sedately with moves like knight f6. So opting for a more traditional setup, more like a Sveshnikov. So hope you guys enjoyed that game. Um, I was thinking about showing my game against Alexander Shabalov. I'm just going to show you a preview of that. Just because this is me, a, a personal experience in the Kalashnikov. I don't have any experience on uh, the black side of this opening, as I said. But this is a game I played against um, Shabalov in 2003 at the Foxwoods Open uh, in Connecticut, I believe. Connecticut or Massachusetts? I think Massachusetts, actually. Um, 
But I was 16 years old, 16 years old when this game was played. And it was um, important to me because Shabalov had just won the U.S. championship a few months prior to this game. And we were playing in the first round of this tournament, and I ventured E4 against him, and we got a Kalashnikov. And this is one of my first victories over a Grandmaster. Uh, so he played E5. I knew about this variation, so I played Knight B5. He played D6. And I reacted like exactly how the club players that Tony alluded to. I played Knight C3. So trying to get into a Sveshnikov, honestly, at the time, I think I was hoping he would play Knight F6 so I could get into a Sveshnikov. Um, so after this, A6, Knight A3. Now here, if you remember the move that is recommended by Tony in the book, give yourself a pat on the back, um, it is Bishop E7. So this flexible move, not yet committing to B5. But uh, Shabala played B5 instead. And I jumped into D5 because I don't want to have my knights forked. And here, he played a move that also kind of highlights the flexibility of the Kalashnikov. We're still in Kalashnikov territory. Um, Shabala played knight CE7. I went C4. Knight takes D5. And here is actually a um, pawn structure that Tony talks about in the introduction. So I have this choice I can take with the E pawn or the C pawn. Now, E takes D5 is very dynamic because you leave tension on uh, the C4 and B5 squares, whereas C takes D5 aspires to more of like a quiet positional advantage. Uh, so if you guys watch my channel, maybe you can predict which move I played. <laughs> um, if you said C takes D5, you are correct. So I took this way. I knew about Shabalov <clears throat> and his reputation as a, a very strong attacking player, so I didn't want to tangle with him in playing E takes D5. But I ended up taking the other way, and I'm not going to show you guys the rest of this game. I'm actually just going to post it, um, my notes to this game, in the comments. But if you're interested, you can take a look at this. Um, it was actually a pretty fascinating game and, and might shed some uh, personal light on the Kalashnikov. Um, so that's about it. I think I'm going to wrap the review up here. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this overview of the excellent killer Sicilian. Um, oh, I actually didn't even talk about the anti-Sicilian anti stuff that Tony recommends. So I should say a few words about that. Um, as I said earlier, he spends 120 pages on lines other than D4. So that includes the Ross Limo, which he says is like a major line that he's encountered. Um, I think he said that he encounters it roughly half the time when he plays the, this opening. So I won't go into detail, but he recommends knight f6 here as a combative way of playing this line, immediately attacking this pawn, often in conjunction with the fianchetto of the dark square bishop. Against knight c3, which is kind of an interesting transpositional move, knight c3 can be tricky to meet because white doesn't rule out the option of playing d4 and going back into an open Sicilian. Like now, if black were to play knight f6, d4 would take us out of Kalashnikov territory because after c takes d4, knight takes d4, white has move ordered us into a, a Sveshnikov with the knight already committed here. So Tony's way around this is e5. He recommends this e5 move in this position. Um, so that way you clamp down on the d4 square and there's no hope of white like playing d4 and and move ordering black, basically. So spends quite a bit of time analyzing that. Um, other things, so aside from knight f3 on move two, talks about the Alapin, the c3 Sicilian. As I said, he recommends a repertoire with knight f6. The analysis looks great. I'm actually going to use this because, um, as you guys know, I've been playing this like kind of janky variation with b6. <laughs> so adding some theoretical uh, clout to my c3 Sicilian defense will be good. And other lines talks about, like close Sicilian, knight c3 on move two. Um, knight c3 is just easy to meet for a Kalashnikov player. You just play knight c6. And he recommends lines that are pretty traditional, involving a kingside fianchetto playing to control the d4 square. And then there's a whole host of other lines he talks about, like just really wacky stuff too. It's very thorough, like the wing gambit. Uh, knight e2 on move two. Um, lots of lines. Against the Smith Mora, d4. He says that after c takes d4, c3, you can just play knight f6, which is advice I give to my own students who play knight f6 against the c3 Sicilian. 
because this is just a direct transposition. Uh, so yeah, um, now I'm going to wrap this video up, but if you guys have any questions about what I talked about, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, I know Tony will be in the comments, and I'm sure he'd be happy to discuss the book. Um, I didn't get paid at all for doing this review. <laughs> Let me just throw that out there. Uh, but I'm, I'm just thankful for Tony for having sent me a copy of this book, and he's a friend of mine, and uh, I think his efforts deserve at least a little YouTube video. Um, because uh, this is quite a good book, and I recommend that you get it if you're interested in this. So thank you guys for watching, and I'll be back with another book review, I hope in about one to two weeks. Bye, guys.